Here's just a quick review about the endocrine system. Most of this should be familiar to you. It shouldn't be uh, completely new information, but I wanted to just do a little review to kind of get you going. So remember that the endocrine system is responsible for the release of many of the hormones in the body. And those hormones um, play a role in, I mean, in body metabolism. <clears throat> they are responsible for stimulating uh, growth and development of childhood and in adolescence. Um, within that piece, they're responsible for growth of the muscles and bones and responsible uh, for the process of puberty and all those changes within the body. So when we have something wrong in the endocrine system, uh, there's a hormone not being made or being released too much or too little of whatever the hormone is, it can significantly impact the growth and development of children. So we have to think about, as we talk about some of these uh, you know, problems with the endocrine system, how does that impact the child and why is it important that I learn about it? The endocrine portion of the lecture will cover pituitary disorders, diabetes, type 1, and sex chromosome abnormalities. Disorders of pituitary function may be due to organic defects or can have an idiopathic etiology, meaning we're not really sure what the cause is. It can cause a problem with a single hormone or with many hormones. And the clinical manifestations of these types of disorders depend on the hormone that is affected. It may result in an overproduction or in a hormone deficiency. One type of hypopituitarism is the growth hormone deficiency, which is caused by a diminished or deficient secretion of pituitary ho hormones. And the consequences depend upon the degree of dysfunction. So not all growth hormone deficiencies are severe. Some of them can be very mild. But, but this type of deficiency leads to a, a deficiency of gonadotropins, a thyroid stimulating hormone deficiency, and a corticotropin deficiency. It mainly affects the linear growth um, and bone density along with growth of body tissues. The main problem with growth hormone deficiency is the, is the delay in linear growth. However, since it also affects the growth of body tissues, it means that the body is still proportioned. Uh, correctly. So when you look at a child who has a growth hormone deficiency, they're short for their age, but their body proportions look normal. Their mass is appropriate for their height. Uh, their skeletal and, um, and sexual maturation is behind that of their peers. And uh, those changes, so that growth and sexual maturity will occur later than usual, but it will appear in normal sequence and manner. So although there's a delay, they will eventually hit puberty and um, and that, that development should occur in a normal fashion. To diagnose a growth hormone deficiency, we look at a couple different things. We start with family history. We want to know if anyone else in the family tends to be small in size, if it's just kind of you know, normal for their, for their genetic makeup to be a little smaller than average, or if it really is a significant problem. We also look at their growth patterns and health history. We want to rule out any other logical reasons why they might not be hitting their growth milestones and looking at growth patterns over time. So this is where that growth chart really uh, becomes very important so we can look at their overall growth patterns for their entire lifetime. We also are going to do a physical examination. Again, we're looking for anything that is out of the normal or could be contributing um, to the lack of growth that we're seeing in the child. We'll do a skeletal survey, which will include a uh, hand wrist x-rays. Uh, by looking at those x-rays, they'll be able to tell how much growing is left to be done, whether those growth plates are, are active, whether they fused early, or you know, any types of skeletal problems. 
we, and then the main the main part of testing includes um, endocrine studies. So we do what we call a growth hormone test, and kids will come into the outpatient clinic or um, the outpatient lab at the hospital, and we'll give them medication um, that will stimulate the release of growth hormone, and then we do a series of blood draws um, and test uh, the growth hormone levels in response to the medication, and that will let us know whether there's a deficiency or whether uh, something else may also be the problem. We'll also look at like their cortisol levels um, and thyroid stimulating hormone. We'll look at those at the same time as well. Treatment for growth hormone deficiency is directed toward the correction of the underlying disease process. So the simplest thing to do for these kids is to replace their growth hormone. Um, and this works for about 80% of children. Um, you may be wondering why, if they're going to grow eventually, why we don't just wait for it. And the biggest concern is that children are going to stop growing kind of at the at whatever age um, it's going to be. So for girls, usually when around when they get their period or shortly after, boys tend to grow till they're about 18 years of age. So if you think about that we have this finite kind of um, end date for growth and how long they have to grow, if we have a delay in when that growth spurt begins, say we delay it by two years, we've essentially shortened that window for their growth to occur by about two years, we may, in some, um, in some cases, actually cut that growth window in half. So even if we wait for them to grow um, a little delayed, they're not going to have enough time to achieve the height that's expected for them. So that's why we are going to go ahead and replace their growth hormone. Then, as they get closer to the time of the epiphyseal closure um, or the fusion of the growth plate, whatever you want to call it. As we get a little closer to that time, they'll actually increase the dosage of growth hormone. And then once the x-rays show that, um, that the growth plates are no longer active, that the epiphysis is closed, then we will stop therapy immediately. From a nursing management standpoint, the, the most important job for the nurse is to identify when there's a problem with growth. We're the ones that are taking measurements and plotting growth charts, so we need to be able to identify when we see a growth pattern that doesn't look uh, correct or normal um, and reporting it so we can do good follow-up. We assist with the diagnosis. We are the ones who complete the growth hormone testing um, and get the blood work drawn and submitted. Um, there may be some family support needs. Now, I mean, it's a growth hormone deficiency. It's not the worst diagnosis in the world. There's something we can do about it, but it still may be very stressful for the kids. They might um, have never been to the hospital before or never had um, any blood work drawn. Um, the idea of getting like monthly or bi-monthly injections can be a little, uh, a little intimidating for them. So, you know, they just might need a little extra support in that area. But, you know, in the scheme of things, it could be much worse. And we also do all the teaching and preparation for testing and medication administration. So we really do the majority of, um, of the care of these children um, and all the teaching that goes with it. We can also see a pituitary hyperfunction where there's an excess of growth hormone. Now, in, in young children, when we have this excess of growth hormone before the closure of the epiphyseal shafts, it just results in an overgrowth of long bones. So their arms are going to get longer, their legs are going to get longer, but it's not necessarily um, going to cause any major problems at this point, except that they're going to get really, really tall. We have seen children reach heights of eight feet or more, uh, by the time they're done growing. Um, keep in mind that there is going to be vertical growth plus increased muscle mass because they're going to look fairly proportionate because it affects uh, the growth of tissue and bone. One of the things that can um, be a clue that we may be dealing with pituitary hyperfunction is, is the delay in the closure of the fontanelles in, um, in babies and young children. So that's another reason why we look at fontanelles. We want to kind of keep track and know 
when they should be closing and be paying attention to when that happens. It can also be caused by a, by a pituitary tumor. And this, I would say, occurs the majority of the time with, uh, with hyperfunction. Once uh, the epiphyseal shaft or the epiphysis is closed, sealed, however you want to explain it, once that happens, then when we have the excess growth hormone continuing, uh, we call it acromegaly. And what happens at that point is the, be if the bones are trying to continue to grow, but they're going to grow abnormally. So rather than bones just getting longer when uh, the growth plates are still active, is we see um, like abnormal or we see overgrowth of the head, uh, the lips, tongue, jaw, and nose, because again, it affects the growth of tissues as well. It affects the nasal and mastoid sinuses. We can see a separation and malocclusion of the teeth, so meaning gaps, and then they move around and shift and twist. Um, the face is disproportionate to the skull. We see an increase in facial hair and thick, deeply creased skin. So this is a picture of someone who has acromegaly. This is obviously not a child. You're not gonna truly see the effects of acromegaly until, um, until we're past those growth years. So other than being a really tall kid, uh, the child's not gonna look especially, um, like especially abnormal, but the older they get, the more we'll see um, those types of signs and symptoms. And you can see uh, the thick, deeply, uh, the deeply creased skin. You can see gaps in the teeth the wide nose, the strong forehead, um, all of those are kind of apparent in this photo. Andre the Giant is one of the best examples of acromegaly. Um, most people know who he is. If you're pretty young, you may not be familiar with who he is. Um, he's a very, uh, a very famous wrestler. And he was also known for his role in The Princess Bride, if you ever saw that movie. He was a French wrestler and actor. He grew um, to 7 feet 4 inches in height and chose not to have his pituitary tumor removed. So his body and bones and muscles continued to grow abnormally until um, it led to congestive heart failure because his heart muscle was affected, became too thick. Um, you know, couldn't pump effectively, and he actually died in his sleep in 1993 from, from congestive heart failure at the age of 48. To make a diagnosis of acromegaly, we're going to look at it uh, for a history of excessive growth during childhood. We're going to look for evidence of increased levels of growth hormone. Uh, we'll do x-ray studies. We're definitely going to look for and try to rule out a tumor and lots of endocrine studies. So we're going to measure growth hormone levels and look at all that. Treatment for acromegaly would include surgical treatment to remove the tumor um, and radiation radio, or you know, radioactive implants to destroy the tumor or, or pituitary tissue. Um, and then once we have taken care of the tumor, um, the child or the young adult will need hormone replacement. It's important for the nurse to identify uh, children with those excessive growth rates early on. Um, this, again, is accomplished through screenings, looking at growth and development, and looking for signs and symptoms that we may have a tumor, um, a tumor uh, like complaints of headache, or precocious puberty, which is going into puberty early. We'll talk about that later. Early treatment leads to improved outcomes. So the best outcomes happen when we intervene early. We, uh, would, we will need to provide the child with emotional support, and there may be some body image concerns as well because of the excessive growth hormones, especially for girls. Um, if they've gained excessive height, that may impact their self-esteem significantly. Now, I just mentioned precocious puberty, and this is the you know, fancy term for when we see the manifestations of sexual development before age 9 in boys or in girls younger than age 8. 95% of cases of, of precocious puberty occur with no known cause, 
it is more common in girls. And what, what happens um, with this condition is there's an activation of the hypothalamic pituitary uh, gonadal axis, which is just a fancy way of saying there's a stimulation or an activation of the part of the pituitary that will cause us to start puberty. It happens early and it leads to a release of the gonadotropin releasing hormones. So for boys, we're seeing um, um, an increase in testosterone levels. And for girls, we're looking at follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, and estrogen. A nursing care for the child with precocious puberty is fairly simple. We're going to give the child uh, Lupron injections to regulate pituitary secretions. It'll be discontinued at an appropriate chronological age. So once they're old enough that we want them to start puberty, we'll discontinue the medication and they should progress into puberty just like, um, you know, just like any other child. It's important to remember that even though the child may be physically more developed, especially if we're talking about girls, they may be getting breasts and curvier hips and things like that, that we need to make sure that parents understand that their dress and activities should be appropriate for their chronological age, even though they may be more physically developed than their peers. Um, it is important to note that sexual interest is not usually there, so these might be you might have a nine-year-old who has some breast buds and armpit hair, but she is not interested in having sex. However, once they, uh, they have that first ovulation cycle before they get their first period, they will be fertile. So there is a concern um, about that maybe we need to do some earlier sex education and making sure um, that the child is, um, is well protected. Here's just a quick review about the endocrine system. Most of this should be familiar to you. It shouldn't be uh, completely new information, but I wanted to just do a little review to kind of get you going. So remember that the endocrine system is responsible for the release of many of the hormones in the body. And those hormones um, play a role in, I mean, um, in body metabolism. <clears throat> they are responsible for stimulating uh, growth and development of childhood and in adolescence. Um, Within that piece, they're responsible for growth of the muscles and bones and responsible uh, for the process of puberty and all those changes within the body. So when we have something wrong in the endocrine system. Uh, there's a hormone not being made or being released too much or too little of whatever the hormone is. It can significantly impact the growth and development of children. So we have to think about, as we talk about some of these uh, you know, problems with the endocrine system, how does that impact the child and why is it important that I learn about it? This is a quick review of type 1 diabetes as you prepare for your lecture. So type 1 diabetes, um, if you'll recall, um, is characterized by the autoimmune destruction of beta cells. Those are the cells within the pancreas that are responsible for production of insulin. As a result of this condition, it leads to complete, uh, complete or absolute insulin deficiency. So we don't make enough insulin for the body to do its job and to break down sugar or to allow sugar to get into the cell is more, more appropriate. So the typical onset for type 1 diabetes is in childhood, um, sometimes in adolescence, but really it can occur at any age. But again, the most most of them are diagnosed in early childhood. It is uh, most common uh, to diagnose uh, diabetes in Caucasians, just as a side note, and remember uh, your main signs and symptoms. So the cardinal signs are uh, sugar in the urine um, or glycosuria, and then the three Ps, those should be familiar to you, but those are uh, polydipsia, polyuria, and polyphagia. And if those words aren't ringing bells for you, remember uh, that polydipsia is, uh, is increased thirst. Polyuria is an increase in urination, so frequent urination. And uh, polyphagia is an increase in appetite, so they're going to be hungry. The re remember that with type 1 diabetes, 
the cells are starving. They're not able to get the sugar that they need. We can't get the sugar into the cell. So as a result, the body feels like it's starving and people are extremely hungry with this condition. Type 2 diabetes is really uncommon in children. We don't see a whole lot of it. Um, we used to see none of it, but in the last few years, I can tell you that I've seen a couple of teenagers who were in poor health and obese um, that were being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. So it does happen. It is out there. It's just not very common. Usually the onset for type 2 diabetes is after age 40, which is per precisely why we won't really be discussing it. But just in case you need the refresher for comparison, with type 2 diabetes, we have a problem with, uh, with insulin resistance. We're making it, the body's just not able to use it. Um, we do see more of this in the Native American populations, um, in Hispanic and African American population. So they're more at risk for type 2 diabetes, where with type 1, we see more of that in, um, in the Caucasian population. So affected people um, may require insulin injections, but sometimes it can be managed with just diet and medication. So we can have um, better outcomes without having to use insulin with type 2 diabetes, where with type 1 diabetes, pretty much always need to replace with insulin. Just a quick review on the patho of diabetes. Um, what we have with diabetes is if, you know, whether there's a deficiency of insulin or, or resistance to insulin, basically the glucose is unable to enter the cell. So the glucose is there in the bloodstream, we just ate a meal or whatever it is, and the sugar has been released. The problem is we can't get the sugar into the cell. So just to make it very simple for you, if you're not familiar, the way I always teach our new onset diabetics at the hospital is that if you think of um, the cell as having a lock, a door with a lock on it, and the only way that sugar can get through that door, past that lock, um, and into the cell is with a key. And that key that, they use, that the sugar is going to use to get into the cell is insulin. So without that key to the door to get past that lock, sugar is stuck outside the cell. It absolutely cannot get in there. So once we add insulin, we provide that to the patient, then that key is unlocked, the door is opened, and the sugar can then make its way into the cell, providing energy for our cells to function. That's you know, diabetes at the most basic level of understanding. So what also happens within the pathophysiology, this is short and sweet, but um, because we have this buildup of sugar in the blood, in the serum, uh, the serum glucose is going to exceed what the kidneys are able to process. And so the glucose, as a result, spills into the urine. That's why we test, uh, you know, uh, you know, test the urine for sugar on our diabetic patients. Then as a result of those things, is your cell is, it is essentially starving. It doesn't have the energy, the sugar that it needs to function. So the cell is starving, and it sends a signal, uh, signal to your body that says, hey, I'm starving here, help me. So then your body says, hey, this body needs some sugar. And so what it does is it begins to break down a protein and uh, you know, convert that to sugar. And this takes place in the liver. And so it will break down protein, turn it into sugar, you know, in the hopes that the body will be able to use it. Treatment for type 1 diabetes is insulin therapy. When we're dealing with children, we have to remember that they're going to learn very quickly how to manage their own illness, and they're going to be able to learn to give their own injections, check their own sugars, and really be very involved in their own care. We rotate sites with children the same as we do with adults, um, and remember that the fastest absorption for insulin is going to occur in the abdomen. We dose the insulin based on the child's uh, carbohydrate intake and their blood glucose levels. So rather than um, relying on sliding scales like we do with adults, we manage them slightly different, and we'll talk about that more in a couple of slides. For glucose monitoring, the goal is to keep them near the normal levels. 
we ideally want to keep them, you know, between like 70 and 110 um, for their blood sugar level. And we also use the A1C as a guide um, as well in children. So, and you're used to seeing that with adults already. Here you can see this child who's a school ager. Um, he, he was perfectly able to give his own injection and check his own blood sugar. Management of type 1 diabetes includes uh, correct nutrition. So we want meals and snacks that are eaten according to the total calories that are needed for a child of that age and size. We, um, we want to make sure they're getting enough exercise. We don't restrict exercise. In fact, we want to encourage it. But we want to um, make sure they know how to manage, um, you know, manage their diabetes along with exercise, making sure they get snacks before exercise, etc. And lots of teaching um, on how to recognize signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia and how to manage those episodes. More on that in a moment. We want to talk to them about illness management. Um, and that it's important to continue checking sugar and giving insulin, even though they're, they may not be eating normally. And then the management of um, diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA, um, and that it's considered an emergency and they need to bring them into the hospital. And, again, and we'll have more on that in a moment as well. With our new onset diabetics, especially our um, our focus while they're in the hospital is going to be on teaching them about diabetes and how to manage their diabetes and use insulin. We're going to teach them the nature of diabetes and the pathophysiology. So, what's happening within the body? We need to explain to them that a cell needs sugar for energy, and that um, think think about each cell as having a locked door, and so uh, insulin is the key to unlocking that door to allow the sugar into the cell. And that if we don't have insulin, that door stays locked. We can't get the sugar into the cell to provide energy. So that's kind of a simple way for us to explain it um, to younger children um, and to parents. So they get that beginning understanding of what the heck is the problem in diabetes and why do we have to use insulin? We talk to them about meal planning and choosing the appropriate types of carbs. Um, and complex carbs and trying to minimize uh, simple sugars and things that we know are going to have a high glycemic index. We're going to teach them how to count carbs and about the carbohydrate ratio. So um, the, the carb counting essentially um, is how we're going to determine how much insulin they need after a meal. So um, each child to sign a carbohydrate ratio or an insulin to carb ratio or carb to insulin ratio, however you want to say it. So let's say a child is given a ratio of 15 to 1. That number is based entirely on their specific insulin sensitivity. So each child gets their own insulin ratio, okay, or um, carb to insulin ratio. So we'll say that the child is given a 15 to 1. So that means for every 15 grams of carbohydrates they consume, they're going to receive one unit of insulin. So for example, if a child consumes a 60 grams of carbs in a meal, they would receive four units of insulin to cover for that meal. Now, one thing to keep in mind is let's say the child consumed 85 grams of carbs, and at that same, same carb ratio of 15 to 1, um, when we do the math, it tells me on the calculator that they should be getting 5.66 uh, units of insulin. So, and as you're used to seeing um, in the adult population, we give units of insulin in whole numbers. You can't give a half or a quarter units. You would round up. On an adult, 5.66 would round up to six units, right? You're just going to give them the six units. Um, but with kids, we want to be very cautious in rounding up. We want to be very careful. So we actually are going to round to the nearest one-half unit rather than whole units. And you can see in the picture here, um, it's showing you actually what the markings on the insulin syringe will look like. So on the right is like the insulin syringe that you're used to seeing, although you're probably used to seeing 50 or 100 unit syringes. So this is a 30 unit syringe on the right, and you can see that the markings are in one unit increment. And then on the left is what we use in pediatrics. So it's still a 30 unit syringe, but rather than having one unit increments, you've got one unit increments, and then on the left, you have half unit increments. So we can actually give one half unit of insulin. So if our math tells us to give 5.66, 
0.66 is actually closer to the half than the whole. So we're not gonna round that up to six units. We're gonna round that to 5.5 .5 units of insulin. Hopefully that makes sense. And we'll talk about this in class a little bit more um, just to make sure that everybody understands it. Um, and then there are two types of insulin primarily that we're gonna use with children. We're gonna use the short acting or regular insulin and our long acting insulin. An example of that would be Lantus. We don't give the rapid acting all that often. Um, and I can tell you, I've never given NPH um, to a child in my career as a nurse. Not that you would never use it, but it's just not used very frequently. So we primarily are going to use our regular insulin that will be given for coverage um, for meals and for correction of high blood sugar. And then our long acting will be given just before bed based on their bedtime blood sugar. And that will give them that um, low uh, basal dose of insulin throughout the day. We need to teach them how to mix insulin if necessary, how to administer insulin um, in each type, how we rotate injection sites and all of that. We also will do teaching about an insulin pump if they're a candidate for that. Most of our slightly older children definitely uh, by the teen years they're old enough to use insulin pumps. Um, it allows kids to live a more normal life, um, not have to pull out um, so much stuff to check their sugar and give shots and all that. They can just do it all in their pump. It can check their sugar and then they can tell it how much insulin they should get after their meal and it will just infuse for them. So that's nice allowing uh, teenagers especially to manage their diabetes a little more subtly um, and not having to make a big deal about it. Just a quick note on blood sugar monitoring. Um, you guys should all know how to do this, but just as a refresher, um, you're just gonna clean the finger with some warm water. We don't use alcohol. We wanna make sure that the finger is clean because in some of uh, the previous studies that I've seen, if you've just eaten something that's full of carbohydrates, grease and sugar, things like that, anything that um, is gonna impact your blood, if it's on the surfaces of the fingers, when you go and poke the finger and get that drop of blood, it's going to be contaminated with whatever was on the skin surface. So you want to make sure that the skin is clean. We want to use the ring or thumb finger are usually um, the best choices because the blood flow is a little better to these two fingers. So um, And then you puncture um, just to the side of the finger pad. So not the side of the finger, but the side of the finger pad. So think of where your fingerprint is on the pad of the finger, and you're just going to go kind of off to the side of that. You don't want to push it too hard and make sure that you have the depth uh, adjusted appropriately if um, your uh, needle is adjustable. So, And in pediatrics, you'll generally see uh, the variable depth ones because you're not going to go as deep on a two-year-old as you're going to go on a 12-year-old. There's going to be a significant difference in depth. So you don't need to go too deep. If you go too deep, you're going to cause some bruising and more discomfort, which is really, you know, can be avoided. It's unnecessary. And then we really tend to use the you know, monitors that require the least amount of blood with children so that one, we don't have to poke as deep so we can use um, a smaller gauge and a shorter needle and we don't have to squeeze as much blood out of those kids and it's a little less traumatic for their bodies. And in the next two slides, you're just gonna see some pictures of a, a, of a child who isn't very old. He looks to me to be around eight years old maybe and he, he's able to do his own finger stick with a little bit of supervision and assistance. So many of the kids, once they're diagnosed and they've had a tiny bit of exposure to diabetes and begun to see how we manage it, they can take over much of the management on their own. Here we have another school ager who's learning to check their own blood sugar, so has a little supervision, um, looks like a healthcare provider that's sitting there with them, but is teaching him how to check his own sugar. And again, um, the child is able to put, put his blood sample into the monitor and run the monitor with a little supervision. So you certainly don't want to leave a child so independent that they're managing their diabetes completely independently, but you want to let them do and touch and have a little bit of control as long as they're appropriately supervised.
Teaching for the child and family with diabetes includes uh, the recognition and treatment of hypo and hyperglycemia. For hypoglycemia, we need to teach them um, that the child will feel shaky, maybe dizzy, uh, labile or irritable, uh, nervousness, maybe even weepy. Um, we'll, ha we'll have them take either some orange juice or some sugar cubes and then follow that up with complex carbohydrates and protein. One of the best examples um, of complex carbs and protein um, for diabetics would be like an apple and peanut butter. It's kind of like the perfect snack. The complex carbohydrate of the sh uh, of the apple is going to be a sugar that is digested slowly and although it will bring up the blood sugar, it will not allow the crash and the protein will help to minimize crash as well. And then for hyperglycemia, again, they'll be lethargic, confused, um, may even appear drunk at times. Um, so, you know, obviously a child with this type of behavior would be, you know, really obvious. So, but we want parents to be able to recognize these signs and symptoms. We want to teach them how to manage minor illness um, and how to keep records and when and what to report to, um, to their endocrinologist, um, how to clean um, their skin before testing, clean the skin before injections, how um, to draw up their insulin using aseptic technique and to do everything um, in the safest way possible. And then we want to provide some family support. It can be really scary to parents who are bringing in their three-year-old um, and getting a, a diagnosis uh, um, of diabetes. That's pretty, um, you know, pretty heavy stuff. It's going to be a lifelong condition that they have to learn to live with and can be extremely overwhelming. So we have to do a good job with teaching parents and providing them the support that they need and really just you know, letting them know that life isn't over. Now you've already learned about DKA uh, previously. Um, so I just want to mention a couple things. We definitely see DKA in children. Um, especially in teenagers who um, maybe aren't as good about, about compliance. Um, they have more independence. And so if they're making poor choices um, with food and with their insulin management, they can get into trouble very quickly. Uh, with DKA, we see progressive deterioration uh, with dehydration, um, electrolyte imbalance. Uh, it can lead to acidosis, to coma, and death. It's considered a pediatric emergency and will be treated in a PICU setting. Um, we're going to give them fluids, put them on an insulin drip, and give them small amounts of sugar. It's going to be done very slowly. Um, we want to monitor their electrolytes and their glucose levels. And then um, trying to get those electrolytes back in balance will be kind of the main priority um, in addition to uh, their sugar and insulin management. If we correct uh, the electrolytes too quickly, we can put them into, um, into cerebral edema, which can also kill them. So it's really important that we, um, that we correct everything very slowly and cautiously so we can manage them effectively. It is extremely dangerous um, to manage a DKA patient, um, and so we need to do a lot of teaching on how to prevent it because it, it really is scary. The other thing that you'll see, especially uh, with teenage girls, is they will have uh, symptoms of eating disorder, uh, bulimia and or anorexia. And what they'll do is they'll manipulate their diabetes in order to lose weight. So we really need to kind of be on the lookout for diabetic patients who have um, like those hallmark signs of eating disorder so that we can intervene um, and get them treatment right away so they don't end up um, in real trouble with DKA. The two sex chromosome abnormalities we're going to talk about are Turner syndrome and Kleinfelter syndrome. In Turner syndrome, we have an absence of one of the X chromosomes. So it affects only females, and it's, um, it, it has an incidence of about 1 in 2,500 female births. Uh, the manifestations of a child who's born with Turner syndrome is a web neck, shield-shaped chest, widely spaced nipples, low posterior hairline, and low set ears. So the web neck, if you think about, um, look between your fingers, and you know how you have that 
little bit of skin that stretches where the fingers join the hand, um, that would be webbing um, in a very small amount. And so that's what happens kind of at the base of the neck where the neck is connected um, above the shoulders. The skin there will be kind of stretched and webbed. Um, the, the low posterior hairline, so if you actually lift up hair or look at the back of the head, um, the, the bottom of the hairline there is going to be lower than it is on most people. Um, and then their ears, if they're low set, um, what you'll notice, um, if you look at someone, look at their eyes and ears, you'll notice that the top of the ears are generally in line with the corner, um, you know, the center of the eye there. And so what we'll see in these kids is their ears are lower than they're supposed to be. So some of these kids um, will actually uh, wear glasses when they're little. And they will sit in an angle because the glasses sit on the bridge of their nose and then the arms of the, of the glasses actually sit on top of their ears, which are lower. So their glasses actually kind of tilt in kind of um, an, upward, um, an upward fashion. Um, the other thing that we'll see is uh, as they're at the age for puberty, they're going to be short for their age. Um, they're not going to have started to develop uh, features of puberty like uh, breast buds, armpit hair, things like that. Um, they also won't start their periods when they're supposed to, and they are usually infertile. So um, the treatment um, and nursing care is focused on hormone therapy. So we're going to do uh, a growth hormone to combat the short stature, and then we're going to do some estrogen replacement um, to help them to develop, uh, you know, normal, you know, normal, normal body features for their age, so that they will go into puberty. Um, we also will set them up with counseling. So, and the counseling is is really related to the potential for infertility. Um, they may at some point need someone to talk about. Um, uh, you know, how they're feeling about the potential to not be able to have children in the future. And Kleinfelter syndrome is actually the most common of all chromosomal abnormalities. Um, it affects only boys, and so we see it in one in about 850 male births. So it's pretty common. If you think about the fact that we have 90,000 babies born in Arizona every year, that's a, that's a pretty big number, actually. Um, so And with this, we have the, president, uh, the presence of one or more additional X chromosomes. So the XXY is the most common presentation. It occurs, of course, in males, and it's rarely seen before puberty and is also associated with tall stature. Uh, so Kleinfelter syndrome might not even be diagnosed until they go seek treatment for infertility in their adult lives. Um, so because they kind of fly under the radar, it's not until they try to get someone pregnant and realize they can't that they even um, become aware that there's a problem at all. Um, so some of the things that we see in them is no sperm in their semen and small testes. Um, they have... A defective de uh, a development of secondary sex characteristics. So um, they're not going to kind of, you know, look as manly, so to speak. They're not um, going to get quite as bulky, have the Adam's apple change, um, become, you know, hairy and, um, you know, like all of those things get uh, the deeper voice, all of those uh, changes that we, that we associate uh, with puberty in boys. They also can present a with cognitive impairment of varying degrees, behavioral problems, uh, can possibly have some gross motor difficulties, poor verbal skills, and shyness. So if we think that a child is just a little quiet or maybe a little slow or has some behavior problems, we may not even pick up on the fact that there's something uh, you know, bigger that's going on here. They may just like chalk it up to a little learning disability um, and a little bit of awkwardness. So again, they can kind of fly under the radar until they go try to start a family. And then when they, um, you know, maybe go for testing for infertility, find out there's no sperm in their semen, and they start doing some testing and looking into things and, um, and find out that this is what they have. The differences that you need to remember 
um, regarding the musculoskeletal system between uh, children and adults are as follows. Um, there is a fibrous membrane between the cranial bones. So we've talked about fontanelles, um, and you already know about the cranial sutures, and that those close over time. So where those openings are in the soft spots, the fontanelles, there's a fibrous membrane that provides some protection to um, the brain and the layers that are beneath the skull. So that helps to kind of protect um, and hold everything together until those bones close. So that's important. Um, the epiphysis, we've talked about that a little bit already as we've discussed growth, but that's where the osteoblasts replace cartilage. Um, in the process of doing that, it pushes the end of the bone away from the shaft, and this is what makes the bones grow, become longer. So when children are in the middle of growing, if we have an injury in this area, that area of the epiphysis, um, it can cause the epiphysis to no longer function uh, in the right way and uh, can inhibit growth in that bone. So especially when we're talking about arms and legs where we have two of them and we want everything to remain uh, equal in terms of length, um, that can be seriously uh, problematic for those children. Growing pains occur as the muscles are stretched in periods of rapid bone growth. So we usually see this with the pre-adolescence and the adolescence that uh, the growing pains um, will happen in times where we're seeing more of that growth. So anytime they're hitting that you know, growth spurt, they're going to complain of discomfort um, and achiness. I've been one to um, tell my teenager, you know, to buck up. It's not that bad, just to man up. And he, uh, you know, tells me, but but my legs hurt, but my arms hurt. And then it occurs to me later. Oh, well, of course they do. He's probably going through a growth spurt and he's having some growing pain. So now don't I feel like a terrible mother? So that's really um, you know, common for us to see with them. Uh, the long bones are porous and less dense in children. So they're going to be uh, bend, uh, buckle, and break much easier. So something uh, like a simple fall can cause a bone to break in children where an adult maybe wouldn't um, be as likely uh, to have a broken bone as a result. Any alterations in the musculoskeletal system can have a significant impact on growth and development. So it's really, really important that we address any abnormalities or problems within the musculoskeletal system so that children have normal growth and development. The slide, the next slide that you're going to see just gives you a visual of um, the effects of immobility on the different body systems. So it's you know good just to kind of refresh and review. Um, how important it is that we keep kids as active as possible and minimize immobility. This slide shows you the effects of immobility on all the body systems. Um, you know, we think of the obvious ones like skin breakdown um, and even uh, the respiratory effects, but it affects every area of the body. And I, you know, we also think of mobility in terms of aging. So as people get older, we have greater concerns, um, you know, with mobility. But it's also a concern with children. So we have to remember that um, as we talk through some of these disorders where the mobility is impacted, we need to think about uh, the overall effects that that can have on their body. Congenital club foot is obviously something they're born with because it's congenital, and it is an abnormality in the development of um, the bones and muscles in the foot itself. It actually includes three deformities, um, and I'll show you a picture in just a minute that will make sense. So the hind foot turns inward, the midfoot is directed downward, and then the forefoot curls toward the heel and turns up almost so that the sole of the foot is um, now in an upward position. It ranges from mild to severe. So you could see these where um, you look at the feet and it, they don't look that abnormal, or it can be extremely severe and, um, and require uh, significant intervention. And this photo is showing those three deformities. You can see how it almost looks like um, there's a uh, like a right angle 
in the heel where the foot um, connects to the bone to the lower leg. Um, you can see how uh, the, the sole of the foot is also kind of turned in and almost upward. So you can kind of see those, um, you know, those deformities uh, you very easily. This is a fairly severe presentation. There are a couple different treatment options. So this can correct on its own. Um, we can teach parents uh, some passive exercises that they can do um, to improve the mobility of the feet. Um, but serial casting is the most likely treatment. This is considered the treatment of choice. Um, it requires early intervention. So we can't wait a really long time to let the child um, start to grow and develop for a few months before we intervene. So this is going to be something that's done fairly early. And I'll show you a picture of what that casting looks like. And then we can also do surgical intervention. So this will be done when either the serial casting was not effective or if it's very severe case and they really don't believe that the casting um, will improve, uh, in, you know, improve the function. So then they'll go in, um, they'll realign everything the way they want it, put in pins, cast it. Um, and in addition to that, they may wear a brace or corrective shoes as, um, as they're, you know, they're learning to walk as they're growing up. So here you can see the cast run from toe to the upper thigh. Um, and this is going to be done fairly regularly. I said serial casting. That's because there are going to be multiple stages. So we're going to leave the cast on for a little while. Then we're going to take them off, give the skin a little rest, and then apply new casts. Now I want you to think for a minute about how those casts are going to impact a baby. The baby in the photo was fairly young. My guess would be about four or five months. And so if you're thinking about um, what developmental milestones we, we should be expecting, think about how those casts are going to impact their ability to meet those milestones. They should be rolling over, getting ready to crawl. And you know, then after that, of course, walking. And so with the weight of those casts on their legs, it's going to really impact their ability to meet those milestones. Um, as with all casting, we're also conter uh, you know, concerned about skin integrity, skin breakdown. Um, there's going to be some parenting challenges. What happens if the child gets diarrhea and we have like explosive stool that gets all over the casts? Things like that. Some of kind of the common sense things that parents are going to be overwhelmed with. And lots of teaching needs. We need to teach parents about cast care. We need to teach parents um, how to improve or um, to contribute to their normal development despite the cast being in place, how to do range of motion exercises, um, all of that type of stuff, what to do if the casts get dirty. All of that needs to be included in our teaching. We also may need to provide a little bit of emotional support. If you think about the scheme of life, being diagnosed with congenital club foot isn't the worst thing that can happen as a parent of a new baby. However, um, a lot of parents have this idea in their mind of having a perfect baby when, when their baby's born. They're, you know, they're kind of expecting um, you know, perfection. And so when their baby is born less than perfect, it definitely requires um, sometimes a little grief. They're, they're going to you know, have some coping needs. Um, and so we have to just encourage parents and, and remind them of the good. I already mentioned cast care, but if um, they're going to need brace or corrective shoes, um, we're also going to need to teach that. Taking off the braces to give them a break. How um, to put them on correctly. How to take care of the equipment. All of those will be important. Developmental dysplasia of the hip, or DDH, is, um, is a problem where, uh, with the alignment of the femoral head and the acetabulum. They're not, um, they don't line up exactly correct. Um, it can present in varying degrees, and the next slide will show you pictures. Um, we can have a dysplasia, a subluxation, or a dislocation, depending on how misaligned they are.
So A is going to show you normal alignment in that hip joint. B is a dysplasia. So you can almost see kind of, you know, the edges of the acetabulum are almost worn away. Um, and so the uh, the femoral head is just a little loose in there. With the subluxation, it's not fully seated in, in the joint. And with a luxation, it's completely dislocated. Just another word for dislocation. Um, so varying degrees, um, you know, depending on exactly what, what's malformed in the joint. DDH may be present in up to 3% of newborns, um, so it's something that we're going to assess for right after delivery with our newborn assessment. It's four times more common in girls. It can be unilateral or bilateral, so it can affect one side or both, and we don't really know why it happens. There's um, thoughts it may be there's a genetic component um, and then kind of another school of thinking that it's the mechanical forces of late pregnancy and birth. If you think about how jam-packed um, that little baby is in utero and you know how difficult um, that or you know the stress that that can place on the hip joint itself so that is believed by some to be um, the more likely cause when you're assessing the child uh, you know, for DDH um, remember, this is usually done in the newborn assessment, and you may remember doing some of these maneuvers. Um, we're going to have a limited ability to abduct the affected hip. So that's um, if you have your patient laying flat, just moving the leg out to the right, but you know, leaving it kind of in line with the body. Or if you're standing upright, the ability to lift that leg out to the side. Okay, we're going to have some asymmetry of the gluteal and thigh fat folds. I'll show you a picture of that. On the next slide, um, you'll have a shortened limb on the affected side uh, because what happens is when we have that dislocation, the muscles will actually tense and pull and it'll um, bring the leg in or up a little closer to the body so that limb will be a little shorter. We'll also see the Alice sign. This is um, an abnormality that when we flex both knees, one knee, the, the affected side, you know, one knee will be lower than the other. And then lastly, or the most common one, and, and you may be familiar with this one, is the Ortolani maneuver or the Ortolani test. And um, so what happens is we'll have a positive, uh, you know, a test that is positive for the Ortolani click. So when we um, rotate or do range of motion on those hips, we'll actually bend the legs, push the knees up toward the trunk, and then we'll rotate them out to the side, down, around, and back in. Um, and what will happen is you'll see, or you'll, I'm sorry, you'll hear or feel a click when that's done, and you're actually hearing um, the, the femoral head pop in and out of the acetabulum. So this picture shows you um, the asymmetry of the gluteal folds. Um, so think about as I'm talking through the slide, which side you think is affected. So on the left side, see how deep those folds are, and on the right side, the skin's a little bit more smooth. I mean, we still have some chunky thigh folds, but it's you know definitely a significant difference between left and right side. Now remember what I said about uh, the muscle contracting and pulling the leg up. So the side that's affected is gonna be the side with um, more thigh and fat folds. So the left side, on this baby is the affected side. Hopefully that makes sense. And this photo just shows um, someone in the process of performing the Ortolani maneuver. So they're getting ready, um, you know, or you know, have you know begun to rotate the legs out to the sides and then they'll bring them around. Um, so you can just get an idea of how that's done. Now let's talk about uh, what signs and symptoms are going to be present in the child who is walking. So this will be an infant who's walking. So if we have our like 11-month-old has begun to walk all the way through childhood. 
So in the walking infant and child, what we're going to see then is the affected leg is shorter than the other. That is really no different. Um, but because they're walking, what we're going to see is a limp. When they walk, um, the femoral head, when they put weight on, is going to push up in um, to the acetabulum and then come back out in between steps. So they'll actually limp um, as they're walking. And we can see marked, lo marked lordosis if we have bilateral dislocations. Now remember uh, that lordosis is when we have um, an accentuation of the curve of the lower spine. So um, where we normally have the spine dip inward toward the abdomen and back out, it will be much more accentuated. And then we'll also see a, um, a waddling gait if the dislocations are bilateral because we'll now have a limp in both legs. So they'll kind of have like a waddling or shuffling gait um, because they're not able um, to walk very quickly. Every If they lift off the ground and take a big step, that's going to make that limp worse. So they're going to have just a funny walk. To effectively treat and manage uh, the patient with DDH, we need to intervene early. Very important. So the earlier we intervene, the more stable that hip joint will become. They won't need treatment or therapy for as long. So that's a good thing. From the newborn to six-month age, what we're going to do is put them in a pavlic harness. And that picture will be on the next slide. Um, and that'll help to abduct or hold the hip into place so that it's not going to slip in and out and keep it in that position. Then between ages 6 to 18 months, this means that we didn't recognize or pick it up with our newborn assessment or in our, um, our early well visits. Um, and sometimes we, they won't see this abnormality till they begin to stand or walk. And in that case, we'll use traction and cast, um, and cast immobilization. So the spike of cast is the, the, main, um, the main means of, um, of treating it in this age group. And that slide will, will be a couple slides away. Um, and then in the older child, really what we need to do is an operative reduction. So the longer we wait to intervene, the more difficult it is to fix or repair. Um, so we're going to do surgery on the older child. And then after age four, um, the, uh, uh, the ability to correct it uh, becomes more and more difficult. So um, it may end up being a permanent condition that we can't do much for um, once they reach a certain age. So here you can see the pavlic harness. Um, it's like got little straps, little uh, strap around the chest, and those straps attach to these little footies at the bottom. So we're basically going to strap the baby in, and um, when you lift the baby up, it's going to hold those feet, those legs, in the position so you're not going to be able to let their legs hang and dangle really far down. So it's going to help to hold those hips in an abducted position. Um, one thing to note is that normally the child would wear like a little onesie or t-shirt underneath to prevent any chafing of the skin. So here they've taken the shirt off so you could get a good picture. But just keep in mind, um, we wouldn't do this against bare skin. We'd have something underneath of it to protect the skin. And in this picture, you can see a spica cast. So, um, and just... Take a look and think about for a minute some of the parenting or the nursing care nightmares that come along with a cast that covers almost the entire body. So as you can see, this cast starts up in the armpits, goes all the way down the belly with a little hole in the center, and then down each thigh all the way to the ankle. So there's not a lot of exposed skin here. So think about from a nursing standpoint and some common sense, what are your biggest concerns here? And we'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, there is an opening here in the belly, and, and that's mainly for assessment, so that you can get your stethoscope in there, take a good listen, hear heart and lung sounds, um, makes it a little bit easier, um, you know, to manage their care. One additional thing I want you to be thinking about uh, as we go through the next slide is how difficult would it be to diaper this child? Think about that for just a minute, um, and we'll and we'll talk about it on the next slide. Um, 
And what happens if we get diarrhea? Think about how difficult it would be to keep this cast clean. What about food bits falling down the top of it? Things like that. So definitely challenging for parents and caregivers. So now I want you to think about what you just saw on the last slide. I told you to think about diapering and some of the challenges. And so what are your nursing concerns? We're concerned about immobility. So what are we going to do for that? Yep, we're going to do skin and neuro checks. Um, so we want to make sure that we're doing a good job with skin integrity. We want to make sure that they're, um, that the cast has proper padding inside and prevent any, um, any pressure areas from forming um, that can cause some skin breakdown. Um, we're going to do frequent position changes, again, to keep the pressure off of one particular area of the body. Um, they're going to have altered elimination. So think about the challenges of diapering again. I um, mean, what we normally do is use a smaller diaper um, to tuck up inside the cast in every direction um, to catch stool um, and urine. And then we'll take a large, maybe like a size 5 or size 6 diaper, the biggest they make, and we'll wrap that around uh, the outside of the cast to hold that other diaper in place and um, to attach it around, you know, above their hips, above their legs. Um, and so that will help with that. But again, think of challenges with diarrhea or, you know, any elimination problems. Definitely concerning. Um, so we want to try to our best to keep the cast clean and dry and avoid any soiling. Again, very challenging. But the double, di the, uh, the double diapering will definitely help with this. We also have to think about the delayed growth that could happen. Um, if we have a legs and a good chunk of their body um, that's covered in a cast, um, are we going to impede growth of those areas of the body? And absolutely we could. So that's another thing to, you know, to keep in mind. We're going to do a lot of teaching on cast care. We want to talk about uh, transportation safety. How do you put that kid in a car seat, right? Um, so they actually make special car seats that can be used. Um, we want to teach them good skin care, how to clean the cast, how to diaper. Um, and sometimes between the thighs, there will actually be a bar in place to keep the the thighs or the legs in, um, in the abducted position that we want. So we have to teach the parents not to use the bar for lifting and moving, which would be very tempting when you're trying to do a diaper change all by yourself. Uh, pain management may be a concern, um, uh, you know, especially more not so much related to the cast, but from the surgery. So once they've you know, kind of recovered from the surgery, um, that won't be such a big concern. So then you have to think about what can we do to prevent the complications from immobility. So we kind of already talked about those as, as we went through concerns. So we want to make sure that we can keep them as mobile as possible, which is going to be extremely challenging. Scoliosis is a lateral S or C-shaped curve of the spine. So this is a side-to-side -side curve. So what happens really is the ribs on the concave side, on the inside of the curve, are forced close together, and those on the outside of the convex side are spaced wider apart. The disc spaces will also be narrowed on the concave side and will be widened on the convex side. So this causes some asymmetry in the vertebral canal. It's the most common spinal deformity that we see, and it is more common in girls. In fact, pretty much every patient I've taken care of in the hospital having surgery for scoliosis has been a teenage girl. There are multiple potential causes of scoliosis, um, but it can happen for no reason. So. We know it's associated with myelomeningocele, cerebral palsy, and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, it may be congenital or it um, can develop during childhood. So they can be born with it or it can come on later. Um, it can be for no known cause or because they're compensating for something else that's wrong. Generally, we're going to notice it after they have their pre-adolescent growth spurt. They may also have complaints at that time of ill-fitting clothing. So if you think about what happens if you know you have that abnormal side-to-side -side curve, um, shirts aren't going to hang right, your shoulders aren't going to be aligned, hips won't be aligned properly, and so clothes just will seem like they don't fit right.
Here you can see a couple different presentations. So picture D shows you normal, straight up and down. Um, e shows you mild scoliosis. So we just have that slight side to side side curve just under the shoulder blades. And in F we have a more uh, you know severe scoliosis. Um, so this is a severe scoliosis where we aren't even able to realign the shoulders and hips. So sometimes we can have a compensatory curve where we're able to keep the hips and shoulders aligned, but the curve in between is pretty severe. And then G shows you uh, the rib hump and flank asymmetry that we see with scoliosis. So think back to late elementary school or middle school when you were screened for scoliosis. Almost all of you probably were. Um, and so remember what they do. They check uh, the shoulder height, have you bend over. They're going to feel along your spine and shoulder blades, and they're looking for any of that asymmetry um, in the curve. Um, so one of the things that we'll see is a prominent scapula. So the shoulder blade will kind of stick out. They'll have that one-sided rib hump which I showed you in the previous slide. And then I already mentioned the compensatory curve to help keep the body in proper alignment. We take a team approach to treatment of scoliosis. So we're gonna have multiple disciplines involved. Um, one of the things that we'll do is a bracing with a TLSO brace. That's a th thoracolumbrosacral orthotic, if you want to get really technical, but it's much easier to just say a TLSO brace. Um, and people who work peds are very familiar with that type of brace. We see them a lot. So we're going to do bracing. Um, we're going to provide them with instructions for exercises to help strengthen the muscles of the back and help uh, minimize complications and keep their alignment um, in the correct position. Um, if it's very severe, we'll do surgical intervention. So they'll actually go in uh, with instruments. They'll do what we call a spinal fusion. They'll realign and straighten the spine with internal fixation. So think about how painful that must be for them to put rods and pins all along the spinal column. So it's a, an extremely painful recovery. These kids are actually probably the most difficult patients I've ever taken care of. They are typically teenage girls, so they are emotional. They are um, not used to coping with pain. You know, as teenagers, it's you know they probably haven't had a lot of painful experiences. So it's their first exposure to really significant pain. Um, they can have major blood loss. Um, they almost always get their periods right at this time because of the stress. And then they have this very painful surgery they're trying to recover from. So they are just miserable, miserable patients. And the parents are stressed out because they're worried and their teens be difficult and they give you bad attitude and, um, and they can be really, really sick and in a lot of pain. So they're a very challenging patient to care for. Here is a picture um, that shows uh, a couple different styles of braces. The one on the left, of course, is a little cuter, has a little bit more style. Um, and then you can also do just plain um, solid white ones. So we're seeing more and more of the creative, fun, and colorful ones because um, it's going to be less difficult for teenagers, right? They're, you know, at least if it's a little cuter, um, you know, it's not going to be quite quite so awful for them to wear it and they will typically wear a little tank or t-shirt underneath and they'll know they'll wear their regular clothing right over the top of it we're going to jump back to surgery for just a minute I wanted to show you those braces first um, so I already told you a little bit about uh, about caring for that teenager, that child. Um, there are going to be concerns um, of body image for this child because of scarring. They have uh, sometimes a pretty large incision. I've seen them go all the way from like T3 all the way down to the lumbar region. So they can have really big incisions. Um, they, you know, it, it's going to impact their body image. Um, you know, preoperatively, we may have them give a, a blood donation. Um, just in case they're going to need it after surgery, there. Um, this is a very, you know, this is a surgery where we have a high potential for bleeding, um, and I've actually seen 
um, one child in the ICU receive, I want to say it was about 21 units of blood over the course of um, two or three days with the surgery. So it, it can be um, very dangerous in terms of blood loss. We're doing a ton of teaching pre-surgery, pre-op. We're going to teach them about a PCA pump, how um, that's your patient-controlled analgesia, if you don't remember those abbreviations, so that they know when they wake up from surgery, they will be have uh, you know, in control of uh, their pain medication. We're going to teach them how to log roll while they're not in pain because when they're in extremely pain after surgery, is that the teachable moment for how to log roll? No. So we're definitely going to do that preoperative so they're ready. We need to prepare them for the fact that they're going to come back with a Foley catheter and that they're going to have a chest tube in most cases. So, um, and that's because if you think about it, we're doing, uh, you know, we're doing surgery on the spine. We're going to have to open up the uh, the thoracic cage there. Um, and so they end up with the chest tube in place um, to help those lungs to reinflate after surgery. Uh, Postoperatively, we need to do an excellent job with skin care. Um, we're going to have them ambulate with physical therapy. We need to give pain medication before they ambulate, before they do all that physical therapy, um, just their pain management in general, and fluid management. Those are kind of your priorities. Um, there can be some family issues. Um, we want to encourage their family and friends to visit, especially friends. Um, we want to help keep the teenager connected. But as I mentioned before, these teenagers are pretty grumpy, pretty irritable, um, and they're not always all that nice to their family members. So sometimes they need a little, um, a little bit of tough love from the nurse to, you know, not in a cruel way, but to remind them, hey, you know, don't talk to your mom that way. Or, you know, you need to be respectful. Your mom is here trying to help you take care of you. You know, you know, I don't, I don't want to hear you talking that way. So, and sometimes a little comment uh, here and there will, will do a lot to change their attitude. Osteogenesis imperfecta, or OI, is also known as brittle bone disease. Um, when we have a child born with OI, their bones are very fragile and more likely to fracture. This is a genetic defect and occurs in 1 in 30,000 live births. So we don't think of it as very common, but it is such a big deal and such a significant problem when it does occur that it's important that you're aware of it. Um, and so what happens with OI is there's a biochemical defect in the production of collagen. There are different types of OI. Um, so we're going to go through um, three of those types. Um, so type 1 is the most common and accounts for about two-thirds of all cases. Um, with this, we have multiple and frequent fractures. Um, they will actually um, have blue sclera, um, thin, soft skin, increased joint flexibility, weak muscles. Um, they have soft, pliable, and brittle bones. So thus the name brittle bone disease. Um, they um, are known for having short stature and poor range of motion. And one of the other things um, that will happen to them is conductive hearing loss when they become adolescents. Type 2 um, is lethal. So um, they are either going to be stillborn or they'll die early in infancy. They have severe bone fragility with multiple fractures at birth. So even just the trauma of a vaginal delivery is enough to overwhelm their bones with fractures. So this is really, really, um, you know, of course, the worst type um, for, for a child to be born with. Um, and then type 3, we have uh, a severe, severe bone fragility that leads to severe and progressive deformities. So um, in these cases, it's going to be identified after multiple fractures. So these are those kids that have these fractures in childhood and, um, and uh, you know, they'll start to have these manifestations a little bit later on and they'll start to be able to put the pieces together. They're not going to grow normally um, and the blue sclera will manifest. And so when all of these things start occurring together, they'll put it uh, you know, they'll make the connection. And most of the child with type 3 are going to die in childhood.
treatment or management um, of osteogenesis imperfecta primarily um, is going to be supportive care. Um, there aren't really effective drugs for treatment out there. Um, they uh, are, we're going to think about OI more in terms of when we have a child who presents with mul multiple fractures in childhood, they're going to want to rule this out before they look at, okay, is this child being abused or something like that. So a lot of times we're thinking of OI um, simply in terms of trying to rule it out when we see fractures. Um, and some of the nursing considerations are going to be uh, taking caution with handling these babies to prevent fractures, lots of family education, um, some occupational planning and genetic counseling for the families, and uh, the complications from immobility. So if we have a child, like with our type 1s, um, who are you know hopefully going to live much, much longer, um, every time they break a bone or have a bone injury, they're going to need to be put in a cast. And that long term is going to impact not only their mobility, but their, but their normal development. So those are kind of our biggest concerns um, with our OI patients. And I'm not going to focus real heavily on osteogenesis imperfecta, um, but it is something you definitely could see on your board exams. So more than anything, just be aware of it, that it exists, um, and just kind of understand the basics about it. Leg calvae Perth's disease is um, a disease that affects the hip. Um, and what we have with this disease is a temporary circulation disturbance to the femoral head, causing ischemic aseptic necrosis. 10% um, of the time, it is bilateral, meaning affecting both sides. So essentially what happens is the blood flow is interrupted. So when we don't have enough blood flow, then the tissue, the bone is gonna to start to die. And really the underlying cause for why this pathophysiology is occurring is really unknown. There are some suspicions that it may be caused by trauma, um, by some kind of inflammatory uh, type of disease or issue. And um, there, there's also a suspicion that it could be caused by coagulation defects, so you know problems with clotting. But we really don't know exactly why it happens, or why it happens only in children. Symptoms that we're going to see with leg calve Perth's disease include a constant or intermittent limp, hip soreness or ache, stiffness, and trouble with range of motion. So for some kids, we're going to see these symptoms kind of all the time, and for some it'll only be at certain times of the day. Typically, these symptoms are going to be worse at the end of day or after activity. So they're not going to be in like severe pain or significant pain. They're just going to have kind of this achy soreness. I would almost describe it as like after um, a really big workout or something like that where you have a body part that's like achy and sore, but it's not extremely painful. Um, and that's kind of how it will present to us. Um, and we're going to confirm the diagnosis with an MRI. We'll be able to see the lack of blood flow on the MRI. Treatment for leg calvae perths is aimed at restoring range of motion and prevention of extrusion or subluxation. So we really want to support and care for that joint so that we don't cause more damage or, um, or like or dislocation. So we'll put them in an abduct brace, sling or harness, or even cast. So think now back to like with what we do with developmental dysplasia of the hip. So this is also a hip issue. So it's going to be similar to those types of things. We're going to want them to rest. So we're not going to want them to overdo it. They're going to be non-weight bearing anyway. So they'll pretty much uh, self-restrict by you know not putting weight on that leg. So it's going to really limit what they can do already. Um, we could po possibly see them in traction. Um, and in some cases, even go perform surgery to try to restore blood flow to the hip. So it just kind of depends on their presentation and you know severity of symptoms. Young children, so those under five, do have the best prognosis with this disease. So the nurse who's caring for this child is going to have to focus 
on on identifying affected children. So kids who are presenting with those symptoms, um, the limp, the aching, the stiffness, all of that. You want to identify that um, and make sure that they're being evaluated. We do a ton of teaching. So how to care and manage the corrective appliance, how to clean it, how to put it on, take it off, all of that stuff. Selection of appropriate activities. So we're going to teach parents how to find activities that are going to give them what they need developmentally without putting weight on that leg. Okay. And then we're also um, going to have to focus on anything that can happen as a result of non-weight bearing. So, you know, activity limitations and how, um, what kind of activities they'll be able to do. Muscular dystrophies. Muscular dystrophies are the largest group of muscular diseases in children. They are genetic, and with muscular dystrophies, what we see is a degeneration of muscle fibers, progressive weakness, and wasting of skeletal muscles. And we'll talk about what that looks like in a bit. All of the muscular dystrophies have increasing disability and deformity along with a loss of strength. We're going to focus specifically on one type of muscular dystrophy, and that is uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, or DMD. It's also called pseudohypertrophic muscular dystrophy because we have a, um, an enlargement of the muscle due to infiltration with fatty tissue. So it's a super hypertrophy because the muscle fibers themselves aren't getting bigger, but the muscle as a whole is being infiltrated with fatty tissue, which makes the muscle appear to be bulkier. This is the most severe and most common of muscular dystrophies in childhood. It's an X-linked recessive gene, which means that it's only going to affect males. And uh, the incidence is 2.2 to 5.5 in 10,000 live male births. All the females in the family may be carriers of this disease. Characteristics of DMD include onset in early childhood. Um, we see progressive muscle weakness, uh, wasting of skeletal muscle, and contractures. We're going to see symptoms occurring primarily, or at least uh, beginning in lower extremities, It'll start with things like tripping, uh, we'll see enlargement of the calf muscles, and as it gets worse, um, we'll see uh, you know, the muscle weakness and wasting work its way up the body. So it's going to go from toe to head. By the teen years, we typically will see a loss of independent ambulation and progressive weakness. So um, they don't have strength and they're not able to walk. Fractures may result in these children from falls. Um, because they just don't have the strength and support for their bones. Um, death ultimately for these children is going to occur from respiratory or cardiac failure, which makes sense if you think about it because we're talking about problem with muscles, right? The muscles are wasting away. Um, so it makes sense that we, we, since we use muscles to breathe and our heart is a muscle, that those are um, the parts of the body that are going to fail and ultimately lead to death. Clinical manifestations of DMD include a waddling gait, frequent falls, lordosis, the hypertrophied calves, which we already talked about, profound muscular atrophy in later stages, so it won't be profound at first, but will become that way. Mental deficiency can be present. Um, we see a mild mental deficiency in about 25 to 30% of patients. And then some of the complications that are going to occur long-term with DMD include contracture deformities of the hips, knees, and ankles, um, disuse atrophy. So the less strength they have, the less able to walk and move, the more the muscles will atrophy. So it's almost like a vicious cycle. Um, as the muscles waste, we use them less, which causes the muscles to waste. So it, it just will exacerbate the issue and obesity. And if you think about, um, these are going to be kids with normal appetites um, who are now unable to be active. And so it's not uncommon for them to gain excessive weight.
This picture shows a young boy with muscular dystrophy who's receiving tube feedings. Um, so he goes to school as much as he can. He's going to be able to do some of his schooling via computer at home. But what I want you to notice is in this photo, I want you to look at his muscle tone. Look at his calves. They've got very little shape to them. His face almost um, has a droopiness to it. His mouth kind of droops down in the corners. Um, he just doesn't have a lot of muscle tone. So, and that is very typical of what a child with DMD uh, will look like. DMD is going to be managed um, based on symptoms and trying to keep them functional. So there really isn't a fully effective treatment that's been established, but our goal is to maintain function in unaffected muscles for as long as possible and to keep the child as active as possible. So this is going to be accomplished through range of motion exercises, bracing, massage, um, you know, making sure that the child is uh, you know, performing as many of their ADLs as they can. A surgical release of the contractures to, um, uh, to help maintain their mobility for a longer period may give them a little bit of relief and extend uh, the period of mobility that they have. Um, and then we have to also look at needs of the family, which include genetic counseling, uh, respite care, so breaks for these families, and uh, getting them in touch with support groups. So your nursing care is really going to focus on providing um, these services, uh, these treatments, and just giving the family and the child support. Um, the good news is there's a lot of research that is going on with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Think about Jerry's kids. Um, you know, hopefully that kind of rings bells. Um, he, you know, was very involved in raising money um, for kids with, uh, uh, with muscular dystrophy. So there's a lot of research being done out there. They're looking at gene therapies and stem cell transplant and how those may be used to find effective treatment for DMD. So hopefully in the near future, we'll see more effective treatment coming along. Trauma and fractures. Fractures, I'm just going to do a quick review on. We're not really going to talk about it much in class, but you do need to be aware of fractures. They definitely occur in children, but you've learned all about them. So I'm just going to do a kind of a quick review so that um, you kind of have the basics and a little bit will be refreshed in your mind. So fractures are a very common injury to see in children. It's important to remember that uh, fractures are rare in infants. They're not really doing anything that would warrant them you know, getting those types of injuries, except if they're in a motor vehicle collision. So in a car accident, of course, we would expect to see fractures. But a child who has a skull fracture or a broken arm, when they're not mobile, is definitely something that should be a red flag to us as nurses. Um, as a side note, the clavicle is the most frequently bone that is broken in children. So especially those, um, you know, you're, you're less than 10 years of age, they're riding tricycles and bicycles and things like that, and they're not really stable on those, so they tend to have falls, and it's very common for them to injure the clavicle. In the school ager, um, we're very concerned about bike injuries and sports injuries. Those are kind of the most common causes for fractures in the school ager. And then in the back of your mind, you always need to be kind of alert um, on the lookout for uh, you know, fractures as a result of child abuse. Um, versus falls. Many kids fall and you know they can certainly have a fracture from that but we need to look at does the injury um, line up with the story um, we were told about a fall is that realistic that a fracture could occur from that particular type of fall so we kind of always have to be thinking about that about the potential for child abuse when we're seeing children with fracture injuries. Just take a look at the anatomy here of the bone so that you get an idea um, where the growth plate is, uh, the epiphysis, um, and then the growth plate just beneath it, uh, the metaphysis and diaphysis. So just kind of be aware of those parts within the bone. That'll make more sense when you get to the next slide.
Injuries to the epiphyseal area are especially you know, concerning uh, because of growth, which we mentioned a couple slides ago. So it's frequently a site of damage when there's a trauma because it is the weakest point of the long bone. So when a bone is going to give way with a break, it's very frequently at the epiphyseal site. So I already mentioned that you know injuries in these areas can affect the bone growth. Um, so it's really important that we address these injuries uh, carefully. Many times what they'll be able to do is pin that injury back together, that area of the bone. So they'll do you know, open reduction internal fixation or an ORIF, and that'll help uh, that epiphyseal you know, area of the bone to heal well and growth hopefully then will occur normally. Even with that, there's no guarantee that the bone will grow normally, but that is the hope. None of this should come as a big shock to you. You should be familiar with the clinical manifestations of a fractured bone. So this is just a quick review. So um, what we'll see on children who have a fracture, they may have some, not all of these, uh, generalized swelling, pain or tenderness, abnormal positioning, like if the bone is sticking out of the leg, that's a good indicator that it's probably broken. If the leg or the arm or the body part you know, is twisted, looks obviously deformed, that's also a good clue. Um, the limb or the area where the broken bone is occurring will usually not function normally, so we'll see a diminished function, won't be able to walk on it or lift it or move it. Um, we may see bruising, um, very likely to see guarding. Kids are very um, adept at trying to protect areas of injury, so they will guard the area. They won't put any weight on the leg or the arm. Um, they'll avoid it at all costs. And you may see some crepitus, or, or rather feel some crepitus. So fracture care, um, again, this should be review. Treatment is aimed um, at re you know, restoring function. So our options here are a closed reduction, which is where um, the physician will just realign or set the bone without doing surgery. So um, this is usually done and then they take an x-ray to make sure that it's all um, aligned properly or they can actually do it in radiology department while they're under x-ray and get it done um, and they can see it right then and there. Um, and make adjustments as needed. Um, I already mentioned the ORIF, so that can be done with internal fixation. You can also see an um, external fixation place to hold uh, the bones where we need them. Traditional traction is used much less frequently nowadays. Um, in fact, I can tell you I've never cared for a patient who was using traction in my career. Um, we usually will splint those injuries until they can get to surgery and then they'll do an ORIF or external fixation right away. Um, and so that you know, belies the need um, you know, for traction. So the goals are to reattain, you know, regain alignment of the bone, retain that alignment once it's in place, restore function of the site, and pre prevent any further injury or complications. So we want everything to function normally. Um, you'll always be assessing for the five P's just like you do with adults. So um, the, uh, to review those, pain, pallor, impulsiveness, paresthesia, and uh, paralysis. It's really important to move the area as little as possible preoperatively. They'll be splinted or at least in an ACE ramp or positioned appropriately, and you really don't want to move that bone unless you need to. So we're going to minimize your movements until they go to surgery. Um, ice and elevate, of course, are really, really important. You all are familiar with rice, um, but you want to make sure that, um, that we're doing everything we can to reduce any swelling. Um, keep the cast um, from you know, getting any dents or uh, pressure put on it, so it's important that we handle the cast with palms um, until it's completely dried, meaning don't use your fingers. Your fingers will dig in and could potentially cause dents and things that will push into the inside of the cast. And that could cause undue pressure on the limb. And then we want to keep small items out of reach. Um, so obviously, probably not with a teenager, but with your younger children, this is important. 
Um, the last thing you want is a cute little three-year-old shoving Legos or Barbie shoes or something you know, equally concerning down into their cast. Um, sometimes they'll get far enough in there that they actually need to go and remove the cast to get those items out and then recast them. So we want to avoid that whenever possible. Okay, these next two slides um, just show you uh, traction and the different types with, with some pictures to represent. Um, I don't really focus on traction um, on your exams, but it is something you can see on your state board exam still. So you should at least have an idea of what traction is, why it's used, and, and the like. Um, I would focus on making sure you understand 90-90 traction, which is very common with children, and box traction. Those are kind of the two... Um, that I hear about the most frequently. So I, I would look a little bit at those and kind of understand what those look like. We discussed sports injuries a little bit when we did our growth and development, but it's really important that um, we're aware of the vulnerability uh, you know, for children when it comes to sports injuries. Uh, their tendons are lax and their ligaments are lax, so the joints have a little bit more mobility and can be strained um, very easily. There's a lack of experience that kids have with how to participate in sports safely and exactly how um, to complete the movements that are required in the sport, so they're more likely to be injured because of that. Kids who aren't wearing protective equipment are going to be at greater risk for injury, and they tend to be very impatient with healing. Once their pain is kind of under control, they're very likely to overexert themselves and get themselves in a position where they're doing more than they should and potentially increasing the chance um, of injuring that uh, the affected area. <coughs> they're also at risk for acute overload injuries as they use a body part repeatedly um, or are you know, bearing more weight with, with their body than they should, they're going to be at risk for those types of injuries. And then with overuse, like you would see with like a baseball pitcher, <coughs> what we'll see with them is repetitive microtrauma um, as they use that, you know, those same muscles over and over in the same action. It will cause small tears in the muscle that can become larger injuries over time. Um, it leads to inflammation, um, and what we'll see in those kids is complaints of pain, tenderness, swelling, and disability. The next slide after this just shows some of the common types of sports injuries that we see in children, just so you kind of have an idea of some of the examples. Here on this slide, you can see some of the common sports injuries in children um, by sport type. So um, some of the riskiest sports, of course, are those um, where we have a lot of physical contact or, um, or repetitive use. So we end up with uh, you know, repetitive injuries. And this last slide just um, kind of you know, focuses on the importance of uh, teaching. So we want to make sure that we're providing good education to parents so that they know how to keep their children safe as they participate in sports. It's important that the coaches are qualified and have undergone uh, training in how to keep kids safe as you know they coach whatever sport it is that they're involved in. Uh, these will help to you know, minimize injury and enhance you know, the performance of the child. Um, it's important that we teach kids to warm up and cool down so we reduce the chances of strain on joints and muscles. And then really the most important thing is we're going to really push the importance of protective equipment. You know, helmets, uh, face masks, eye protection, mouth guards, elbow and wrist guards, gloves, knee pads, shin guards, um, you know, etc. But that covers the majority of them. And I can tell you as a snowboarder, my kids snowboard and my husband and I do as well, and when we're out on the slopes I mean, these days, pretty much everyone is wearing a helmet. It has become not only widely accepted to wear a helmet when participating in those types of activities, but really kind of the standard. And it's considered pretty cool to wear helmets. Um, you, know, you know, within the young uh, you know, people that are participating in these extreme sports, if you look like it, 
at the X Games um, and Olympics, everyone is wearing a helmet. So it's really become more the standard and expected that kids will wear, wear helmets, which is wonderful. Welcome to your voiceover for pediatric neurologic function and dysfunction. Let's start by reviewing the pediatric differences of the neurologic system. Um, the infant's brain and spinal cord are at greater risk for injury because of a couple of different factors. One is that we have an incomplete ossification of the bone. So the skull is, um, we could say the bones are slightly on the soft side. So like if we lay a baby in one position all the time, we'll actually see that section of the head um, get a flat spot. And that's because those bones aren't fully hardened yet. We also have open fontanelles in infants, which put their brain at greater risk for injury. The nerve cells are immature, takes many, many years for nerve cells to completely develop. Um, so our brain growth isn't even complete until between 12 and 15 years of age, which always makes me wonder why teenagers aren't a little smarter with their decision making. But that is neither here nor there. Um, we also have incomplete myelination at birth. So the brain and spinal cord aren't fully myelinated. This is why we see reflexes in babies, uh, those primitive reflexes like the startle, moro, rooting reflex. All of those are primitive reflexes. And as that myelination occurs, those will begin to go away. So, and if you think about it, the myelination occurs in a head to toe fashion. So it's gonna be, um, all the reflexes are gonna go away in a head to toe fashion as well. So like the rooting reflex will go away a little earlier and then other reflexes will follow as that development occurs. This also is um, will occur in conjunction with acquisition of fine and gross motor skills. So as they acquire those skills it's directly related to myelination and the reflexes going away and that brain and spinal cord development. Also in children the brain cells are easily damaged if blood flow and oxygenation are not maintained. So um, their cells are more, are more vulnerable to oxygenation problems, so we really want to avoid any hypoxia in children because they're going to be at greater risk for injury as a result. Quick review on seizures. Seizures are periods of abnormal electrical discharges in the brain that cause involuntary movement of behavioral and sensory alterations. So they're caused by a malfunction within the electrical system of the brain. We can have non-epileptic seizures that are typically the result um, from acute illness or medications, and these will cease when the problem is resolved. So um, with epilepsy, this is when we have recurrent unprovoked seizures. So seizures are a characteristic of epilepsy, but not all seizures are epileptic. Um, and it's caused by a variety of pathologic processes in the brain. Um, and optimal treatment and, um, and prognosis requires an accurate diagnosis and determination of cause. So in simpler terms, for us to be able to accurately treat someone with seizure disorder, we need to know why they're having seizures. And that is where the challenge lies. Of the generalized seizures, the most common type that we see in children involves both hemispheres of the brain at the same time. A febrile seizure is a type of generalized seizure affecting approximately 3 to 8% of children. Usually, they occur between the ages of 6 months and 3 years, and they're very rare after age 5. They're also twice as frequent in males. They're associated with temperature greater than 39 degrees Celsius and associated with illness. And we know that there is a familial tendency. So if we know that there's a history of febrile seizures in a particular family, then we're going to be um, more on the alert for that uh, with subsequent children. And a complex febrile seizure can lead to epilepsy. So we can have what would normally be a single seizure event become um, an actual like epileptic condition. So let's talk about general seizure management. 
Your nursing interventions include assessment and monitoring. Those are kind of the primary focus. We want to observe seizure activity, observe their level of consciousness, and for signs and symptoms of hypoxia. We're also going to monitor them during their post-ictal period as they recover from their seizures. Your priorities on your patient with a seizure are their airway, so we're going to position them on their side, make sure their skin is pink in color. We're going to protect them from injury. That includes uh, padded rails and helmets. And if you, for those of you that have already spent some time um, in a pediatric unit um, where they take care of neuro patients, you'll see kids in helmets. And those are the kids that are having seizures frequently enough that there's a good chance when they go down that they could have a head injury if they hit their head. Um, and the other thing is medication safety. So our seizure medications, if given IV, are going to be given slow IV push. Pushing a seizure med too quickly can cause, can cause significant side effects and complications um, and may even lead to you know, really severe problems. Um, if you have a patient who is um, on seizure meds and say they're going to be going down for procedure, um, you're always going to give the seizure meds. So even if your patient is NPO, you're never going to hold seizure meds because the last thing we want is to hold seizure meds on a patient who is going down um, for surgery and because we held their seizure medication, they actually end up having a seizure in the OR. So those are things to be very concerned about. In seizure management, the goal is to control seizures or reduce at least the frequency and severity. We also want to discover and correct the cause to get the optimal treatment for our patients. And some of the things that we can do for seizures, um, in addition to drug therapy, which you'll see on the next slide, um, we can um, do a, a diet modification with a ketogenic diet. That's that high fat, low carb diet where we know they're getting adequate protein and they're getting energy from fats. But for these kids, they definitely need some vitamin supplementation. So that has to be in the forefront of your mind. We can try a vagus nerve stimulation. This is typically done with an implantable device. So they'll do surgery and implant a device that'll help to stimulate the vagus nerve, which can kind of override the seizure signals. Um, and epilepsy surgery is also an option for those that are affected with a tumor or lesion of some sort within the brain. Um, if we can remove it, um, then that may improve uh, you know, their, uh, their seizure disorder. These are some of the common seizure medications that we use in children. You don't need to focus on all of them. I'll kind of point out what's important here as we go through. The benzodiazepines are probably the most commonly used. If those are given IV, they have to be given IV push. It mentions here on the chart uh, diazepam and lorazepam, but that also includes uh, midazolam as well. So these are very sedating. Uh, the patient will need to be monitored closely. Uh, the diazepam can also be given rectally. And the midazolam um, is something that we can give um, now intranasally as well. And that's given um, via an atomizer, very similar to what um, we see with flu mist, if you've ever did, um, administered or received that. It's very similar. We put the atomizer right on the top, and it turns um, the liquid essentially into a spray. A phenobarbital is also used sometimes. Um, it is extremely sedating and tends to have a lot of side effects. We don't see this used really frequently, but you may see it now and again. Um, and then Dilantin um, or Phenotin, um, that is also used um, for status epilepticus, um, very commonly used to stop those seizures. Uh, and that you know, also needs to be given slow IV push. Child needs to be monitored very closely. Um, for respiratory depression, making sure their vital signs are normal, and that type of thing. Um, the other ones at the bottom, you're probably not going to see quite as frequently, um, so you really don't need to focus on those. The treatment goal for a child with seizures is for them to live as normal a life as possible. So with good pharmacologic management, um, they you know, hopefully won't be having seizures um, too terribly frequent and they can 
do normal kid activities, go to school, be around friends, go to, you know, sporting events, things like that, and still be able to participate. Um, so to make sure we're doing a good job with pharmacologic management, we need to monitor therapeutic levels as indicated, depending on the medication we're using. We need to remember that the dosage will likely need to be increased as a child grows. Um, we may need to monitor for known side effects and, ab uh, and avoid abrupt discontinuation of the medication. So we're going to gradually reduce the dose um, until we've weaned the child completely off and, um, and increase them onto um, or you know, you know, increase the dose on whatever medication uh, we're switching to. I already mentioned uh, status epilepticus. That's where we have continuous seizures for up to 30 minutes or even if we're having back-to-back -back seizures with, um, with almost no rest time in between. On those patients, we want to get a set of ABGs. We want to give them oxygen and then we want to get, get IV access so we can give them medications. So, and I, of course, already mentioned uh, the diazepam can be given rectally if we can't get a line, or we can do the intranasal uh, midazolam or Ativan. Um, and then both can be given IV. So those are kind of um, the drugs of choice. And, um, and then you can see in the table below, it shows you what your management includes, um, which of course is maintaining their airway, keeping them safe, administering oxygen, um, and, and med safety. So those are, um, you know, you can kind of read those on your own as well to fill in the gaps. When preparing uh, to discharge or send home a patient who's having seizures, we want to make sure that the whole family, or at least the parents, are trained in CPR. We want to make sure that they have a per not just a prescription for rectal diazepam, but that they filled it and they have the medication available at home in case of emergency. And then we need to talk to them about activity restriction. So if we have a child who has a seizure disorder, um, you know, we want to make sure they're not, they're not swimming, or at the very least not swimming alone. But some kids won't be able to do certain activities for safety. So we can get them a helmet. If they're having frequent seizures, we're going to teach them no swimming alone, um, an awareness of the school. So we need to communicate with teachers and the school nurse, things like that. We're going to not let them drive um, and make sure that all the caregivers and babysitters um, are in the loop and have received the training that they need just in case. Rice syndrome is associated with viral infection that's being treated with aspirin. So we can give aspirin to a child who doesn't have viral illness and um, them not have this complication occur. So they really have to have both in place. So viral infection and treatment with aspirin. So a couple examples would be like chicken pox or varicella and influenza. When the child develops Rye syndrome, um, the signs and symptoms that we're going to see are severe vomiting and neuro impairment. So we're going to have those changes in level of consciousness. What really happens with Rice syndrome is cerebral edema occurs, and it also causes liver dysfunction. So as they get worse, the cerebral edema will get worse and worse, throwing off electrolytes. And then, the, um, and then as the as the liver as the liver dysfunction gets worse, we'll see their liver and liver enzymes and ammonia go up. So this is really rare today due to the elimination of aspirin use in children. We just don't use aspirin these days because we don't want to take a chance. So um, you shouldn't see this very frequently, um, the, which is the good news. The bad news is it has a very high mortality rate. So if we have people who aren't, who aren't educated and don't know, um, th this is you know really bad news for children. It can definitely kill them. Um, so it's important that we teach parents to give acetaminophen or ibuprofen for viral illness and fever. So we want to make sure that we're teaching parents just don't use aspirin. It's so much easier to not use aspirin, um, with the exception of those few times where we know uh, that aspirin is going to be extremely helpful in treating them. But the benefits really have to outweigh the risks. Hydrocephalus is caused by an imbalance in the production and absorption of CSF. 
So we have impaired absorption of CSF within the subarachnoid space, an obstruction in the ventricular system, and it's important to know that it's associated with myelomeningocele, um, which we'll talk about in just a couple of seconds. Here's a picture of what happens uh, with hydrocephalus. So on the left is a normal head and brain, and on the right you can see the hydrocephalus. So um, the lateral ventricle, third ventricle, um, and fourth ventricle are filled with CSF because it can't be reabsorbed effectively. So that makes the ventricles fill and fill and fill with CSF, which puts uh, pressure on the brain matter and the brain stem, and it's going to cause uh, pressure all throughout the head. So we end up with a bulging fontanelle, and it's actually going to push down on the brain stem, um, and it can, act, it can actually lead to, uh, to a herniation of the brain stem. The clinical manifestations of hydrocephalus include abnormal head growth, bulging fontanelle, dilated scalp veins, uh, separated cranial sutures, and frontal enlargement. So that's just with the head itself. Um, so those are going to be kind of your hallmark symptoms. We can also see the setting sun sign, and that's where essentially if you were to draw a line right across the center of your eye uh, from corner to corner, you'll see that that line kind of goes right through uh, your pupil and your iris. And so what happens is the pupil and iris, or the eye itself, actually drops down so that it peaks up over the lower lid, almost like a sun setting on the horizon. We also are going to watch for depressed eyes, so the eyes will kind of sink back um, as the head becomes more swollen. Um, they tend to be very irritable. They're lethargic, they, and they cry with movement. And it's not just kind of a just a normal I'm unhappy cry. It's a very shrill, high-pitched cry. So it's got a very distinctive sound to it. Therapeutic management includes relief of the hydrocephalus. So essentially we want to drain the cerebrospinal fluid from the ventricles um, and you know, relieve that pressure. Uh, and we'll talk about how that's done in just a minute. Uh, therapy um, needs to be done um, for problems of motor development. So these kids uh, can definitely have some developmental delays. So that's something that we want to intervene with. Treatment for this is most often uh, uh, surgical. So they're going to actually put in what we call a ventriculoperitoneal shunt or VP shunt. Um, but we can have some complications from shunt placement. And that's that's also kind of one of our big concerns um, is managing the shunt and watching for infection or obstruction. Here you can see what the BP shunt looks like. They essentially are going to put a little hole in the skull there, um, put the shunt into the ventricle, and then the, the attached uh, catheter here is going to be tunneled under the skin and it's going to go all the way into the abdomen and they curl a little bit of extra um, of the tubing in there to allow for growth. If we didn't leave any extra tubing you can just imagine how often they would have to go in to have this revised. So a little extra there for growth um, because we don't want to have to go in and do surgery very frequently but you also don't want it so long that it could like get tangled or knotted up. So it's yeah, we just have to find kind of you know the happy medium there, um, so that we don't have to hopefully go in and, and do this quite as frequently as we would otherwise. The greatest period of risk for shunt infection is within the first one to two months after placement. Um, we can see all different types of infections, including septicemia, bacterial endocarditis, wound infection. Uh, shunt nephritis is a rare infection of the kidneys um, from an infected shunt, and it essentially will or will eventually lead to blood infection. Meningitis and ventriculitis. So in these cases, we're going to give massive doses of IV antibiotics, um, 
and or remove the shunt. So we may take out the shunt. Um, that doesn't mean that will always happen, but they'll remove the shunt, leave just an open drain in temporarily, and then they'll do a new shunt um, once the infection has resolved. Neural tube defects are the largest group of congenital anomalies seen in babies. Um, and a little background here, and we'll get into what the problem is in a moment. But normally, the spinal cord and the nerve roots are encased in a protective sheath of bone and meninges. This, that's like normal spinal cord and brain protection, okay? And we'll talk about um, what's wrong in just a moment. It may involve the entire length of the, of the neural tube or a small portion of it. So we usually see it on the lower part of the back, but can happen really anywhere along uh, the neural tube where it develops. Um, the incidence is it's more common in girls than boys, and it occurs three times more often in Caucasians compared to African Americans. The exact cause is unknown, but what for whatever reason, there's a failure of the neural tube to close during the embryo's early development. So the neural tube is one of the first parts of the fetus, or the embryo, I should say, to develop, um, and it's what will turn into the brain and spinal cord and nerves within the body. So this is very, very early in pregnancy, three to five weeks, where we usually don't even know that we're pregnant or maybe just finding out um, that we're pregnant when this defect is occurring. So usually by the time you find out you're pregnant, you're already past this. So it's a genetic mutation in the folate pathways. So, and we'll talk about folate in just a minute. So maternal factors that will increase risk or contribute um, to a neural tube defects is maternal obesity. So moms who are obese are more likely to have a baby with a neural tube defect. Moms with diabetes are more likely to have a baby with neural tube defect. And those with a low folic acid status, which is the same thing as folate. So we know that if we aren't getting enough folate or folic acid, that will increase the risk. So the best treatment for neural tube defects is really prevention. So we teach our pregnant moms to supplement with folic acid. Um, we give them 0.4 milligrams every day. Um, uh, is like the ideal. And so you'll find that in women's multivitamins. Um, in 1998, the FDA also began to fortify cereal and grains with folic acid. So that would just helps make it a little bit easier for women to get enough folic acid. We're going to begin um, the folic acid supplementation preconception because as you know, we usually um, are already past this point when we find out that we're pregnant. So you want to start that treatment or um, that supplement early on so that we don't have a baby develop this before we know we're even pregnant. And that just that simple folic acid supplement will prevent 50 to 70 percent of all cases of neural tube defects. So it's a huge, huge factor in prevention. We'll be able to diagnose a neural tube de defect a couple of different ways. So we can do um, an ultra, uh, sorry, I'm an amniocentesis between 16 and 18 weeks of gestation, and what they're going to look for is the elevated alpha fetal protein. So that'll give us kind of a start point or something to let us know, you know, something's not quite right here. Um, they may be able to identify it on ultrasound. Um, we can also uh, diagnose it from um, chorionic villa sampling, or CVS, and that's where we take a little uh, sample of the placenta. And so with these babies... We're going to make sure that we do an elective pre-labor C-section um, so that we can decrease the motor dysfunction. And when you see the defect on the next slide, it's very obvious um, why we wouldn't want mom to, to labor and have a vaginal delivery. Here you can see a nice rendition of what a myelomeningocele looks like. Um, and so this is a baby, you know, on his back and on the side, so you can kind of see what it looks like. But you essentially have this sac that's protruding out of the lower back is usually where we see it, although it can happen up higher. So, and then on the right here, you see like the different presentations. So you can see a normal spinal cord and vertebrae. 
And then you can see the spina bifida occulta, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And that's just where we don't have a visible external defect. The meningocele, which is kind of the myeloid version, where we don't have neural elements in that pouch. And then the myelomeningocele, where we actually have neural elements in that pouch or protruding out of the back. So now we'll go through the three different types of neural tube defects that we just saw in the previous slide. So the spina bifida occulta is usually in the lumbo lumbosacral region, so L5 to S1, um, and we'll typically see skin indicators, although they may be absent. So you can have just one of these or you can have a combination of them. So you can have just a skin depression or dimple, um, a sacral angioma or port wine nevus. So, um, most of you have probably seen a port wine stain, um, but that'll be kind of on the lower part of the back. We can see little tufts of dark hair in the sacral region, and sometimes all we see is a soft subcutaneous lipoma, which is really just a name for a fatty lump underneath the skin. And spina bifida cystica is when we have a visible defect um, with an external sac-like protrusion. And again, there are two types here. The meningocele is where the sac contains just meninges and spinal fluid, but no neural element. So they typically are not going to have any neurologic deficits. And then the other one, or the more severe, is the myelomeningocele. And the sac there will contain meninges, spinal fluid, and nerves. And this is where we're going to have the neurodeficit. So obviously the myelomeningocele occurs when the neural tube fails to close. This can occur anywhere along the spinal column, but as I mentioned before, usually in the lumbar or the lumbosacral regions. It may be diagnosed prenatally or at birth, but again, we do not want this baby to be delivered vaginally and endure the, uh, the pressure of labor. Um, again, the sac contains meninges, spinal fluid, and nerves. Clinically, the term myelomeningocele is often in, uh, used interchangeably with spina bifida. So sometimes you'll see people or you'll hear people talking about spina bifida, and lay people are generally referring to myelomeningocele, and they just say spina bifida kind of out there in the world. In addition to those terms, the brand new term that is most commonly being used now to describe myelomeningocele is myodysplasia. So you're not going to find that to be truly updated in all literature, but that's kind of the new accepted term, and those um, can be used interchangeably. The location and the magnitude of this defect will determine the nature and the extent of impairment. So generally speaking, the higher it is on the back or along the vertebrae, um, the more severe symptoms they're going to have, the more, the more defects or problems. So um, if the defect is below the second lumbar vertebrae, we're going to typically see some flaccid paralysis of lower extremities and some sensory deficit. But the higher up it is, the more symptoms that we're going to have. It's not necessarily going to be equal on both sides of the defect. And then remember that the sac can be a fine membrane. Um, it's very prone to leakage of CSF and is very easily ruptured. I kind of think of it as like an overfilled water balloon where you fill the balloon so, so full you can tell like if we bump it even the slightest bit, it's just going to blow up. So, and that's exactly what it looks like actually too. And I'll show you a picture here in just a moment. It may be covered um, with dura meninges or skin, though. So it's not always that extremely fine membrane that's super fragile. Sometimes we have a little bit of a thicker covering over it. So here you can see two, two myelomeningocele. The one on the left is an intact sac, and then the one on the right is ruptured. So I want you to kind of think about, like, anatomically what you're seeing here, and um, think about what that's going to mean for, like, our nursing care and treatment. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. And you can actually even see um, a little bit of dark skin surrounding or beneath the myelomeningocele, and that's that, uh, those skin abnormalities that I mentioned.
So initially, when we have a patient with a myelomeningocele, our first priority is preventing infection. So we want to make sure that we either keep the sac intact or if it's already ruptured, protect it from infection. Okay, so we want to do an assessment of their neurologic status and figure out how uh, significant the dysfunction or the defect is. And then surgical closure is going to happen within the first one to three days. So it's something that will happen very, very quickly. Once we've already got our plan in place to go to surgery and you know the baby's already kind of delivered, maybe sent down to the NICU, um, the nurse at bedside um, is still going to be focused on preventing infection. That's still your highest priority. We want to inspect the sac frequently. Um, we're going to prevent any trauma to the sac. We don't want to bump it or put any pressure on it. So baby's going to be positioned on their belly or prone. We want to perform a thorough neuro assessment and reassessment. So we want to assess the movement of extremities, uh, the infant's behavior or LOC, and no rectal temperatures. We don't want to risk that we could uh, like, like perforate the rectum trying to get a temperature and potentially introduce um, what could be deadly bacteria into the cerebrospinal fluid. So that, that would be a really big no-no. So no rectal temps at all. We're going to observe their urine output, monitor for abdominal distension. Um, we're going to measure their head circumference and assess the fontanelles for bulging. So remember we um, I mentioned one of the things that can cause hydrocephalus and it's strongly associated with myelomeningocele. So we know when we have a myelomeningocele that we have a greater risk um, of developing hydrocephalus. So that's all um, so that we can, we can assess for that. Baby's gonna be placed in an isolate with no clothes and we're gonna, be, uh, we're gonna do frequent sterile moist dressings to the sac. So essentially at bedside, you're gonna have a bottle of sterile water, sterile gloves, sterile four by fours and all of that. And you're going to soak that, that, that sterile gauze with sterile water. And you're just going to place that on top of, um, of the sac to keep it moist. Because think about what could potentially happen if that um, thin skin or membrane gets too dry. It's going to be more easy to rupture. So ke keeping it moist and I mean, covered in sterile dressings will help to protect the sac and, and decrease the risk of rupturing. Cerebral palsy, or CP, is a disorder of the development of movement and posture. It causes activity limitations that are attributed to non-progressive disturbances that occurred in the developing fetal or infant brain. So essentially, it's going to be a problem with movement and standing. It is non-progressive, and it is related to problems that, that occurred while the brain was developing, essentially. It is characterized by abnormal muscle tone and coordination. It's the most common permanent physical disability that we see in childhood. Um, it occurs in about one to two in 1,000 live births. Um, and uh, 15 to 60% of these children will also be diagnosed with epilepsy. The etiology of CP is not entirely clear. Um, it can happen prenatally or postnatally. Prenatally, um, it can be uh, from some unknown brain abnormality, can be related to genetic factors, and it can be related uh, uh, to prenatal or perinatal injury. An example of that would be birth asphyxia. And we know that, uh, that prematurity is a factor. About 12% of infants born prior to 36 weeks will have CP. We also know that uh, that prolonged labor can be a contribution. It can lead uh, to chorioamnionitis, um, which is an infection of the amniotic membrane. And um, this is one of the concerns we have um, for not letting a woman uh, or a woman who is in labor go um, an extended period of time uh, with ruptured membranes. So that, um, that is part of the concern there. It can cause them or lead to CP. And postnatally, um, we see uh, just a couple of examples are shaken baby syndrome and bacterial meningitis.
There are a couple different types of CP. Um, you can see them all here, but we're really just going to focus on spastic, which is the most common. And with spastic CP, what we have um, is hypertonicity of muscle, uh, poor control of posture, balance, and coordinated motion, poor fine and gross motor skills. So we're really going to see this um, become very obvious with, um, with growth and development. So they're not going to be hitting their developmental milestones. It can also involve both arms and or both legs, all extremities. It can affect one extremity, or we can even have it affecting three extremities. So it, um, so it can present um, in varying degrees from child to child. Signs and symptoms that you'd expect to see in the child with CP. Um, some of the physical signs would be poor head control after three months of age. So by three months of age, they should be getting a little better at controlling their head and neck. Um, they'll also present with stiff or rigid limbs, which is you know, definitely abnormal for an infant. They'll arch their back and push away. They may present with floppy tone. They're unable to sit without support at eight months of age. And they'll have clenched fists still after, uh, like after three months of age. So um, you can see very clearly here that their developmental milestones are not being reached. Uh, behaviorally, um, they're, they're excessively irritable. They won't smile on time. And they present often with feeding difficulties. So we'll see persistent tongue thrusting. Remember, that's the, uh, uh, that indicator that a child's not ready for oral feeding. Um, and this normally goes away about six months of age when the child's ready to feed orally. And we'll see that, um, that behavior you know, continue. Um, and then the other thing that we can see is frequent gagging or choking with feeds. And that may be for the, for the baby who's still on formula or breast milk or being fed um, some table food. This photo here kind of shows the typical presentation um, for CP. So you can see that this child has um, her hands are in kind of a funny position. She's got her head cocked to the side, but it's not that you know she's watching the nurse or making eye contact. She's kind of in this position, uh, looking away. You can see her eyes aren't aren't really open, extremely wide. This is kind of a very typical look, and um, that left arm especially has a bit of um, kind of uh, you know, like like a distort in kind of a distorted or abnormal position. In order to diagnose a child with CP, um, we are going to do good assessment early in infancy on any infant that we know is at risk for CP, um, and any child who's. Um, already not off to a good start with milestones, we definitely want to follow up with them and do a really thorough developmental assessment. Um, we'll do a neurologic exam and history. Some neuroimaging may help us you know, identify the cause of the developmental delays. We'll, we can do metabolic and genetic testing. Um, and then we look at IQ. So there's a very wide variation, but 30 to 50% uh, of CP uh, patients are gonna be cognitively impaired. Um, but in varying degrees. And of course, you know, this is going to be really difficult to assess in infants and small children. As they get older, we're better able to evaluate that. Goals of therapy are to establish locomotion, get them walking, get them moving, um, uh, communication, um, and self-help skills. So we want to get them moving, get them talking, and get them... Um, to be proficient or at least be able to participate in their ADLs. Um, we want them to gain optimal appearance and integration of motor functions. We want them to be able to do and move as normally as possible. We're going to correct any associated defects as effectively as possible. Um, this may be uh, correcting some of the deformities that it can occur long term with CP. And we want to provide them with educational opportunities appropriate for their ability. So we want them in school. We want to get them uh, connected to special education um, and resources that are going to help them be successful in a classroom. We want to promote socialization. We want them to you know, communicate 
play, spend time with other children, and we want them to achieve maximum independence as they get older. Therapeutic management for the child with CP includes a lot of different options. So um, they may uh, need help with walking. We can include uh, ankle or foot braces to help provide a little bit of support um, and orthopedic surgeries to correct some of the spastic uh, deformities that occur um, in our CP patients. Um, we're definitely going to get them like physical and occupational therapy to, again, help with the mobility issues. Pharmacologic agents can be really effective in helping with spasms and seizures that we associate with CP. Uh, baclofen pumps are frequently used um, to help with symptoms. Uh, benzodiazepines are also extremely effective. If you think about, um, you may be familiar with using uh, uh, Valium for people who have really severe fractures. Um, we give that actually to help with, with the muscle spasms and reducing that, which in turn will help with pain and discomfort. So that can be very effective with any type of spasms and seizures. Um, and botulinum A injections. Um, you might be familiar with Botox, might have heard of it before. So that can be used to think about what happens when we inject Botox into somebody's face and it relaxes the muscle, right? So that'll help to weaken or to relieve the spasticity. We also want to do a really good job with dental hygiene. Um, they may not have the strength, uh, the strength and muscle control to um, take good care of their teeth and brush effectively, so they'll need a little bit of assistance with that. And we also um, see a lot of these kids uh, with G-tubes, um, and they'll get feeds through G-tubes. If, um, if you think about, uh, we have an issue like with muscle control, and so um, it's, very free, you know, it's very common for them to have choking feeding issues. So the G-tube feeds will help ensure that we can get them the nutrition that they need, even if they're not really able to take enough food in orally. We can help to kind of supplement. Um, so a lot of these kids will just do feedings overnight, um, while they're asleep and then they'll feed orally to whatever degree they're able to during the day. And then because they have a G-tube, we're, we're going to make sure we have some type of um, a gastric acid reducer. Uh, so Zantac is kind of a good example, but there are others that can be used as well. In addition to uh, physical therapy and surgery and all of that, they may need assistance with, uh, uh, with mobility. So this little kid here um, it, um, is using a set of two canes to help with mobility. And this adorable child who I just love, he's so dang cute, um, he is using a walker to get around. So that's going to allow him to have mobility. Um, and sometimes you actually see these kids in walkers where they can sit in them. Kind of, it's almost like what you, um, like an infant walker, but much more strong and durable and allows these kids who are having trouble um, to have a little bit more mobility. Your nursing care management for this child um, includes assisting the family in devising and modifying equipment and activities. So this may be um, you know, anything from um, how can we make them more comfortable at the dinner table, how can we make them more comfortable in the classroom, um, to how do we make it easier for them to get the child in and out of the vehicle, transport them around, things like that. We want to um, do a lot of education on medication administration and safety. We want to promote good nutrition, skin integrity, good mobility, and growth and development. So those are kind of our key goals um, from a nursing standpoint. Lots of safety precautions. We're going to talk to them about preventing respiratory infections. If we already know there's like a choking um, aspiration risk, those two kind of go hand in hand. Um, so we want to make sure we're not forcing them um, to feed orally when they're really not able you know, to handle that well. Uh, recreational activities need to be modified, but we still want them to get um, the opportunities to be active. Um, and supporting the family. So these kids need full care. There are a lot of work. It can be very stressful and weigh very heavily on these families. So we need to give parents uh, those respite care breaks, give um, the rest of the family a chance to maybe go do some things um, 
you know, that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do if taking the child along with them. So we need to, you know, move into the home at times and support the family so they can, it may be time to go Christmas shopping or for the parents to, you know, go to their own doctor's appointments. It could be something very, very basic. And I, I've also seen uh, respite care to the point where we get the child care temporarily so the rest of the family can, you know, go on a vacation um, and just really get time to kind of de-stress um, and get an escape from the stress, um, you know, of managing that child all the time. So with your near drowning, which we also call a submersion injury, death occurs from asphyxia while they're submerged underwater. Um, it can occur with even very small quantities of water, even, you know, just a couple of inches of water in a bathtub or a small pail of water can be enough um, for a child to drown in. And we'll truly uh, label them with a diagnosis of near drowning if they've survived at least uh, uh, for 24 hours after the submersion. Um, and if the child survives, um, we call it a submersion injury. Near drownings are the leading cause of unintentional injury related deaths in children between one and 19 years old. So this is a little bit older. Um, you know, these, these statistics are always a few years behind. They're released in 2011. We don't have any new statistics since then at this point. Um, so uh, the risk is greatest from birth to four years and then 15 to 19 years of age. And so the teenagers, you can associate that with poor decision making, diving in places where it's dangerous, things like that. The most common locations for drowning are the bathtub and pools. So about 78% occur in bathtubs and 32% occur in pools. And here in Arizona, the pool, um, uh, the pool percentage is going to be a lot higher because we have so many pools here with our warm weather. Um, and it's, it's also associated, um, associated with risk-taking behavior. So um, like drugs and alcohol in the teenagers um, are certainly a contributing factor. So the damage um, from drowning really depends on the length of submersion, their physiologic response, and the level of hypothermia involved. Um, so cerebral recovery depends on the effectiveness of initial resuscitation and critical measure to support cerebral salvage. So really the primary problem with these drowning injuries is hypoxia, so we don't have enough oxygen. So uh, the neurons will suffer irreversible damage after four to six minutes of submersion, and then death uh, within a couple of minutes from that, most likely. Uh, the aspiration is another risk, so that can lead to pulmonary edema, uh, to atelectasis, to airway spasm, and pneumonitis. I mean, hypothermia is also a factor. So, um, but in this case, it's actually a bit of a positive. Um, so, cold water um, uh, drowning may make the resumption or maintenance of cardiac function much more possible than it would be otherwise. So, you know, we don't want um, to say, oh, it's good if it's cold water, but um, from an outcome standpoint, that is a, a better scenario. Now, the best predictors for a positive outcome after a near drowning would be with cold, non-icy water, a submersion of less than five minutes, the absolute worst is anything greater than 10 minutes, um, that when we remove them from the water, they are in sinus rhythm, their pupils are reactive, so you know essentially there's some neurologic responsiveness at the scene. Um, and when we do CPR at the scene, that increases the chances of survival. So if you think about um, the conditions that we have here in Arizona, we're so hot most of the year that with the heat, that really makes outcomes much, much worse. So the risk is even greater here with our warm weather. Care is going to depend on the condition of the child. Um, we want to help the, care, uh, the parents cope with feelings of guilt. So if you think about it, drowning is almost always you know, completely preventable. So it's, it's usually a case of lack of supervision or a, a moment of distraction, those types of things. Um, so the parents are really going to be really nervous 
and anxious and fearful and feeling a lot of guilt um, related to the outcomes. And then we want to do a lot of teaching for prevention of drowning. So this ideally should be done before we have a near drowning. But even um, as a child is recovering, we have an opportunity to do some education um, with the family about how to prevent um, something like this happening in the future. Your nursing care management is going to focus primarily on assessment. So um, if you're the nurse who's caring for this child, you're going to monitor or assess their responsiveness, their spontaneous respiratory efforts, vital signs. We're going to put them on a CR monitor. Remember, that's a cardiorespiratory monitor. So we're monitoring their heart rate as well as uh, uh, their respiratory rate. And it'll pick up uh, the actual rise and fall of their chest. We'll have them on a pulse oximeter. We're going to do frequent neuro assessments and blood gases as needed. Okay. In addition to that, we're going to be providing a lot of emotional support. We need to provide that support in a non-judgmental uh, fashion. We need to encourage them to express their feelings. We need uh, we discuss uh, the end of life and decisions that may need to be made if appropriate. If we know that this outcome is going to be bad, this this child just isn't going to make it um, because of whatever uh, you know they're presenting with. We need to start having those discussions, preparing the family for the eventuality that their child may not survive. Um, and in in the opposite vein. Um, we can plan home care if appropriate. So we're going to be talking about like prevention and safety and pool fences and teaching CPR and all of the things um, that they'll need to know um, prior to discharge. So after a, um, a near drowning or drowning, um, they may end up you know, being, uh, uh, being diagnosed as brain dead. Um, so the thing that would indicate we're approaching kind of the, the point of brain death would be um, if they're in a coma with apnea, uh, they have a complete loss of consciousness. Um, they're, they, we have an absence of brain stem function, um, including uh, non-responsive pupils. Um, they will be completely hypothermic and or hypotensive. They'll have a flaccid muscle tone um, and an absence of spontaneous or even induced movements. So they won't even pull away with painful, uh, with painful stimuli. The exam needs to remain uh, consistent throughout the observation and testing period. So we can't see a fluctuation. It's, it's either it, it's all or nothing. Um, and then the observation periods according to age. Um, so it's going to vary a little bit. But essentially, we're going to have two EEGs in, at uh like separate time periods, and both of those need to show flat EEG waves.